Who'd like to then come back in with a question? On some, yes, sir. The table at the front here with the microphone. Thank you. Hi there. Um, ben Whitaker from Masabi Mobile Tickets. Um, I'd like to come back to uh, Anna Walker uh, with a question, but picking up on some of the points by uh, Jim and also by Roy, um, I think there's some very good uh, success stories of where the uh, commercial uh, TOC operators have actually come together and collaborated to try and really change things and move things forward. Um, in this particular example, it's uh, e-ticketing and sort of new ways to get people onto trains. They said, you know, we can knock three to five minutes off uh, many peak time services by not forcing the customer to arrive three to five minutes earlier to buy it. Let's get them buying it on their mobile phone. Mm. And this is a weird situation where um, there are, the government has uh, legislated a specific form of e-ticketing mm. at great cost which uh, the, I think the government's Dettica report looks, it looks like it's going to be about towards a billion pounds worth of cost and 10 years to deliver. Whereas the train operators have got together, collaborated and put together something that they're going to be delivering over the next, say, 10 months without any government subsidy. And with that, they're delivering live timetable information to the mobile phones, giving customers that exactly what Jim was talking about, that kind of connected, empowered passenger and um, I think several of them are getting that live for this Christmas to try and answer the, uh, the regulator's uh, sort of input last year. So there'll be live disruption information, mm -hmm. et cetera, Absolutely. free, yeah. free to customers for the entire UK rail network, yeah. which is okay. quite good. My question is, sorry, <laughs> um, if we see regulation coming in to increase cost or rather require more subsidy and we can see that something is getting in the way of the industry delivering something cheaper and quicker and more appropriate, is there any mechanism to question that, or do we just have to put exactly what is required in the franchise and, and, and put up with it, or is there a, a way of questioning that and saying, we can deliver more for less if the regulation is lessened, if the specificity of e-ticketing is removed and the government simply says, please deliver e-ticketing or better ticketing? ORR believes really strongly in regulation which is based on outcomes rather than specifying a particular route. We have got a tricky transition period, though, um, and we've got franchises which have got specific things in, 70% to be refranchised over five years. One of the really big issues for government is ensuring that they can have the confidence that what they're buying with public subsidy will be delivered through specifying outcomes and not ways of getting there. And we certainly, it was a very small example, but it picks up on what you're talking about. Uh, we had exactly this issue where it was southern, not southeastern. And there were issues which were TfL was finding very difficult over the use of Oyster cards. And what emerged was that southern had a franchise requirement to deliver their, I've forgotten the technicality, but they basically had to deliver their tickets through particular machines which made using the Oyster difficult. And in the end, actually, after some quite intensive discussion, they changed their position. And as I understand it now, that problem is fundamentally solved. Um, it was a pity that we had to move away from a franchise requiring a particular mode in order to look at the outcome that we all wanted to deliver. So I think it's possible it'll take working out. OK, some big challenges. Okay, this um, next question, I can see a gentleman at the back there, with hand. thank you. Good morning, Peter Barber from Blake Lapthorne Solicitors. Um, can we come back from the passenger for a minute to the taxpayer? Uh, and this is maybe a question I should have asked David Higgins when he was here. Um, with the present structure of network rail, the present governance system of network rail, how do you see that um, network rail can ever be truly accountable or perceived as accountable to the taxpayer? Or to put it another way, um, how can the sanctions that are in place at the moment, uh, and particularly heavy fines on network rail through the present, present governance system, actually achieve that sort of accountability? Perhaps we'll ask Anna to ask that first, and then we'll come back to Sarah. Well, I think I would say two things. Um, uh, the normal approach to monopoly companies, 
providing crucial public services. And don't forget that Network Rail is a private sector company. But to those companies providing public services, which Network Rail undoubtedly is, is to have the framework of economic regulation put on them. Um, we have been concerned quite clearly as the regulator to uh, uh, ensure that Network Rail is operating as efficiently as possible. We want, and it's something I'm going to be talking about this afternoon, to move on and bring different incentives to play in the future to try and achieve this. Now, one of them is absolutely plays to the way that Network Rail wants to change itself, which is to actually begin to benchmark different routes against each other. That won't tell us exactly about Network Rail's efficiency in particular areas, because each route will be different from others. But it will begin to do two things, ask questions about differences, and fundamentally put more information into the public domain for the debating of this. One second point, if I may, because it is really crucial to the answer of this question. We also actively want to look at more market mechanisms using competition in various ways where we can, trying to encourage network rail to become the system operator of our network um, uh, and be responsible for maximizing capacity utilization, whereas the regulator has a lot of that at the moment. So really to use market mechanisms to try and ensure greater efficiency. Thank you. Sir Ryan. Broadly speaking, I agree with uh, everything that Anna has said. I think with a, what is a monopoly or semi-monopoly provider of something like infrastructure, you're, you're, you have to have a framework of economic regulation. Uh, that's far from the whole answer, as Anna would, would I'm sure, agree. Uh, having been an economic regulator of BAA in, in the past, I recognize the limitations as to what the regulator can, can achieve. Uh, I think the point about benchmarking is very important. In the case of network rail, when it has been a single monolithic whole, the regulator's job is very, very difficult. Uh, with the devolution into routes and the opportunities for benchmarking that that will give, I think that gives both network rail and the regulator a big opportunity to do a, a better job. I think the subject of transparency of information is very important. Uh, it, one of the things that has surprised me about the railway, it, 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 in many ways, it's a public service, it's very considerably public funded. Uh, I've been surprised at uh, how difficult it is to get information from on, on the innards of it. <laughs> Everybody keeps the information very close to their chest, but again, that, that is improving as regards network rail. But the final point, and I think it's absolutely crucial, is the leadership thing. I don't think anyone listening to David would doubt his intense desire to, to be accountable, to do a much better job, and that factor, plus the others, I think will, will give us an outcome that's much better than what we have seen in the past. Thank you. Good answer. Thanks very much. Gentleman at the back. Chris Jackson, Burgess Salmon. Um, the, there was mention of the need for a rail systems agency um, to make the system work. Um, there have been precursor bodies um, in the past, Wheel Rail Interface System Authority um, and the TPWS System Authority, um, and for similar sort of reasons, the need to actually take a system-wide view. Um, those founded for two main reasons from recollection. Um, the first being effectively difficulty getting heads around accountabilities, liabilities and ultimately insurance in terms of getting them to work with what the other main players were doing. Uh, and then secondly, a reticence by supp the supply chain um, in sharing its intellectual property uh, and fierce defensiveness around that. In setting up the Rail Systems Agency, is that learning being looked at and if it is what's the thinking about how those two things that turns into roadblocks are avoided this time around Charles. well since i introduced the uh, subject chris i better answer it didn't i <laughs> uh, f first things first i think um what you've said it, there's a clue in what you've said about the re one of the reasons why those entities 
um, well not failed because some of them have a continuing life but probably haven't delivered as much as they would be expected to deliver is because actually they were subject or, or subject specific entities and I think the, the benefit of the RSA is and as Sir Roy has scoped it out and has, has been carried forward from that initial thinking is that it's meant to be much more all embracing to look at the whole issue of um, the railway as a system and to help objective decision making to happen uh, in a way in which has not been possible in the past. Um, so, you know, it is early days. The, the program team looking, or the project team looking at the creation of a rail systems agency um, are working through a number of issues. There are many challenges in this. Some organisations, some, some of them will be cultural, some of them will be about uh, people's willingness to come to a party and all those other issues. But I think those tensions and those problems are understood. We don't yet, I think, have all the solutions to those problems, but we do have a realisation that this is a potentially significant challenge to establish the RSA, but it's also a massive prize. So that's why I have confidence that it will be delivered, but I'm also realistic to believe that, that there's a lot to be overcome to create it. This is, this is, this is new thinking, it's not been done before, uh, and to actually have something which looks right across the industry um, is exciting and daunting as well. Jim, do you think the RSA could have a role in helping us develop some of the thinking around some of the areas you've been talking about? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I tried not to get too specific. Certainly not, you know, hard for me to be prescriptive, but I would say that absolutely. I think Charles's points are spot on. You can't look at, you already have silos of data today, silos of information. You don't want to create new silos just by turning it around, but keeping barriers between separate agendas or separate, separate points. You have to have the holistic view, number one. But I think this is heavy lifting. I mean, this is not easy because you have to have a responsible steward. The responsible steward has to have security. They have to be respectful of that security. They have to be trusted to actually fulfill this role, but they also have to be mindful of if they fail to meet the availability standard. The SLA that the public demands, if, for the vision that I was talking about, it presumes that it's like the flipping on and off of the light switch. That data and information needs to be there. It can't be, oh, sorry, website's down or the portal's not working or our password authentication server went down and we can't help you out, okay? That, that's just unacceptable. So there is a, re a huge responsibility to this that just putting it in place, getting the political will behind creation of the right agenda, the holistic view, is just a part of the puzzle. Keeping it going, sustaining it, will have a whole lot to do with delivering on the vision. Okay, well look, we've heard um, a great deal from our guests this morning and I'd like you to thank me for joining Anna, Jim, Charles and Sir Roy for their presentations and for their questions. Um, we're now going to take uh, a break. We've got until about 25 past 11. If I could ask you to come back in here for 25 past 11. Uh, there's coffee and refreshments outside. Thank you just for our guests uh, again for this morning. Thank you.